Dennis Quaintance. He's CEO and CDO, Chief Design Officer of Quaintance Weaver Restaurants and Hotels. In 1979, he moved to Greensboro, North Carolina to manage a restaurant. In 1988, Dennis teamed up with Mike Weaver and opened the Lucky 32 restaurant in Greensboro in 1989. Today, the Quaintance Weaver restaurants and hotels family include a Lucky 32 Southern Kitchen in Greensboro and Cary and four additional businesses within a mile of the original Lucky 32. Please welcome Dennis to the stage. Howdy. I am um, I'm really excited to be here in Winston because I'm spending a whole lot more time here uh, even though I live. You're right, you can't see a blooming thing. <laughs> I can do whatever I want. Uh, uh, I'm by myself. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm spending a whole lot more time here in Winston because uh, it's always been my stomping ground. In fact, I moved here first when I came to uh, came to North Carolina, 101 Avalon Road, but that's a long story. But, but just in the last uh, few months, we um, wandered into the R.J. Reynolds building and said, uh, really on kind of a civic mission to say, um, may maybe we can have some ideas about what to be done with this, can be done with it. And we fell in love with, with the building and the prospect of putting a small luxury hotel in it. So we're hoping that that happens. We've got a lot of work to do to make sure that it, <laughs> wouldn't it be cool? Um, and if we do, it'll be, it'll be, uh, it'll be, it'll be uh, progressive from a sustainable practice perspective, and if it's not cool, then I'm going to commit suicide. <laughs> um, but what I've learned is a hell of a lot about that building, and it's really uh, fascinating stories uh, that, that's come up. One of the more interesting ones is, if you draw a straight line from Pilot Mountain to the Reynolds building, the chapel that we're in, steeple is in a straight line between the two. That's how they located Waite Chapel. Isn't that cool? Um, so uh, the idea is that's commerce. I hope I'm pointing the right direction, <laughs> not Pilot Mountain. And, uh, and that's uh, nature, and this is the other one. <coughs> the, uh, so, <laughs> sorry, uh, entrepreneurial, <laughs> entrepreneurial ventures is the sort of topic of this block. And you know, I've been feeling good, but my wife's had a cold, and just getting up here, I noticed that I have this sort of voice that I have usually after I drink scotch. I kind of like it, but normally I have sort of a squeaky voice. This is a good deal. Um, but anyway, if it's entrepreneurial ventures, you got to kind of cut through that and say entrepreneurialism uh, essentially has a, a, a basic rule, uh, as does capitalism, and that is that, that you have to have more income than outgo. So the rule is, and if you don't maintain that rule, if you break that rule, then they kick you off the team. You have to go play somewhere else. So, so let's not be shy about that and begin with the idea of money, because that's the idea of more income than outgo. Somehow, along the lines, even though I didn't read very much when I was coming along, I, I too went to a place without, uh, went to a school without running water, electricity in Nevada before we moved to Darby, Montana, the metropolis. Um, and because uh, my dad was in the business of capturing wild horses in, uh, in uh, Nevada and transporting them to Montana for rodeo stock. So I didn't make it in that macho world, so I had to find something else. But, uh, but I, uh, uh, along that way, even though at Hellgate High School, when I was working as a housekeeper's assistant, it's called a houseman, I did manage to run into some things that I read. I don't remember where I read it. I, most of what I read was on the bathroom walls. But, uh, but what I read that really captured my attention and has had a huge impact on me is this. Money, like prestige, is seldom, if ever attained, if sought directly, but must be the byproduct, or rather the likely byproduct, of pursuing worthwhile objectives. For me, that really allowed me to enthusiastically go off and play some entrepreneurial things because I wasn't uh, turned on with the idea of just going out and making money. I really felt like I, did, I wanted to live a full and rich life, not one just sort of pursuing that sort of thing. So that became a cornerstone for the way that I, I thought about things. Somewhere else along the line, I ran into this notion. 
All paths in life are the same, and none of them mean anything. So choose the path with heart and pursue it impeccably. You all know that's Carlos Castaneda's, I'm sure. But um, I didn't read the book. I just sort of read it on the back of uh, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I, hell, I didn't need to read the book. That was all I could think about for the next 25 years. That's a, that's a, a lot to consider. So those two cornerstones, along with um, this idea that I ran into by reading Bruce Mao's Incomplete Manifesto for Growth, where he argues, and I agree so enthusiastically, that, that with this, this plank to his Incomplete Manifesto is that process is more important than outcome. When outcome drives the process, we will only go where we've already been. If process drives outcome, we might not know where we're going, but we'll know we want to be there. <clears throat> so if you take those three ideas and put them in a shake and bake bag, you, you come up with the ethos that, that, that runs our little organization. And you also come up with uh, surprising to me because we didn't have it as a direct intention because we weren't outcome oriented but the first lead US Green Building Council leadership and energy and environmental design platinum hotel and restaurant in the United States <laughs> yeah who, who would have thunk it? We, and what, the way we got there was by not trying. We, all we did is we decided that we were going to be sincere about the idea of asking, is there a sustainable angle to every decision we were considering? We looked through a sustainability lens. What, what happens is when you're making a decision, you always, everyone's trained to make a, 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 a decision with a financial uh, lens and with a style lens, or some of us, um, and, and with a, a durability lens. We have all these lenses that automatically load, but sustainability isn't even a lens that we have in our, uh, uh, our pocketbook, much less, I've learned, does, does the lens, want, lens once you choose to, to load it, have any information on it. So it was a very it, sort of difficult process, which made it all the more delicious. Why be alive and just skate along on smooth sailing, driving some heavy car on a straight road that, <laughs> with wide margins? I mean, lean the sucker into the curves and see if you can have some fun with it. And that's sort of <laughs> what happened with us with this thing, because we had no idea where we were going, but we were liking everything that we were getting to. And we realized that we were, we were, we were opening up a, such a wonderful process, because what we did is we knew that we wouldn't be able to get very far with this sustainability objective if we, we did the normal stuff. So we had sort of a crazy kickoff meeting. Plus, we were terribly uh, worried about it because who wants to waste money? Who wants to, to have a $30 million investment that, that, that goes bankrupt or has a, a $1 million, $2 million HVAC system that doesn't perform well? I mean, guests, they don't care if you're using must, less electricity. They just want to get up on time. They want a, a shower. They want basic stuff. So what we did is we brought all of these design professionals in and, and, uh, and uh, made the, this room as dark as this one looks to me now and, uh, and played Alison Krauss singing Come Down to the River to Pray at about 80 decibels. And then I came up with just a spotlight on me. This seems sort of the familiar. And I said, welcome to the prayer meeting, my brothers and sisters. <laughs> and uh, so to sort of knock them off guard, and I went through the whole design intent. We, did, we didn't start our, our design process with an outcome intention other than some basic things like how many rooms we would have and, and some stuff like that. We started it with the idea of, of let's pursue causing the guests to say this when they leave. So we had a whole list of responses that would happen, an ultimate outcome, but not a building outcome. And it drove the design team crazy because when we got to the sustainability plaque, they wanted uh, uh, an answer, they wanted, they asked questions like this, how much energy do you want to use? For instance, ASHRAE, uh, ASHRAE 90.1 is the standard for energy consumption with the uh, U.S. Green Building Council's uh, lead program. So how much below that do you want to be? If you get to 15%, you get 10 points, blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, yeah, I can give you a really specific answer for that. And I usually had to stand behind some bodyguards when I said this. But uh, uh, the, the amount of energy we want to use is exactly the amount where we don't waste any and no one is ever in uncomfortable. 
Yeah, so it is. I agree. Hire that guy. Um, the, uh, so, so anyway, that's, that's the, the process that we undertook with it. And what was astounding to me is that, that we, we ended up finding all kinds of very simple ways that we could use less energy and create more, a more healthful indoor, indoor environment, uh, recycle. We recycled um, almost 90% of the construction waste. It was incredible what we were able to accomplish only because we grabbed a lens, threw it up in front of our faces, and if it didn't have data going to it, we were enthusiastic about finding the data. What we said is let's be comfortable being living in that intersection between idealism and practicality. Let's be the practical idealist. Let's not hate that conflict. Let's love it. And if we're not in that conflict, let's realize that we're not in the right place because we're not finding the sweet spot between our idealistic ideas. I mean, I got to tell you, we, we took this, uh, this sustainability uh, thing on for, for a number of reasons, but one of them is 13 years ago, my bride, uh, gifted uh, this family with boy-girl twins, and our son Dennis is right there. Rock on, brother. And, uh, <clears throat> and when, they, uh, when they came home, Nancy and I would, our fav one of our favorite things to do, I can't go into all that, um, but uh, one of our favorite things to do is to go for walks and talk about things. And one of the things I said is, you know, we've always been enthusiastic about sustainable practices, but we've always been careful because of this rule about more income than outgo. We don't want to break it. And we had some really interesting early stories with our sustainability stuff. Like we were back 20 years ago, we were recycling cardboard. And one day I went out and the guy picking up the cardboard had borrowed our hose off the back dock and was hosing that down. And I said, well, that's sure thoughtful. You're hosing it down so it won't catch on fire. And he said, no, Oh, those fools buy it by the pound. And uh, so I said, I said, you're a crook, man. We don't want to do business with you. Again, I was standing behind a big guy. And, uh, but I really did. I said, you're out of here. Why would we want to, you know, try to do something that's good karma with some turkey that's doing bad karma? So get on the road, man. So, you know, we had a hard time. So there's so much of this greenwashing stuff out there and just feel good junk that we just sort of were turned off by it. But when we realized these children were at home, we realized this idea of a legacy was no sort of ego trip sort of word. It was just a fact of life. If you got kids, there's going to be a legacy. And so we said, what we think that future generations are going to say, if you could bring someone from five generations from now, I can promise you that they would say, I, I, I can promise you they would say this. I'd say, so how do we do as a generation? They'd say, you know, uh, we're not real tickled. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of things that I'd like to say, but I'll start with this. We are as prosperous and even more prosperous than you folks were. We're using a fraction of the, the resources, energy and other resources that you were using. And we're using technology you invented. How can you defend that? And then you start stuttering around saying, well, everyone else was doing it and all that kind of stuff. But we really realized that we didn't have a good argument. And we also realized that it's silly to, to, to experiment with the passenger compartment of this spaceship that we're on. It's a very cruel thing, only about three miles up and even less than that. And, uh, you know, I always described it as that we're just flying around on a spaceship that looks like a tennis ball, and the passenger compartment is the fuzz. Don't mess around with the fuzz. And, and, and so as much as I'm not a scientist, I get that if we're really planning to inhabit this for the next few hundred thousands of years, I mean, we're thinking like 2,000 years ago was a long time ago. What BS, man? You know, we're just getting going as a species. We just became this, this, uh, this, this, this species that is all pumped up on itself because it walks upright and has this opposing thumb thing and, and a capacity for abstract thought, but it doesn't do a hell of a lot with it, does it? Because we just end up still hurting and watching, running around, following each other, and 70% of our economy is consumption. Oh, yeah, we're smart. I mean, it's unbelievable what we end up doing, and, and what we do with the energy economy is, is extraordinary. And, hey, who wants to go broke? If you capitalize a business, you got to be practical. You can't run around and just throw all of your ideas up there and, and go broke on, based on your ideas. It, that isn't very damn creative. 
You know, it's created to figure out how to live at that intersection between, like I mentioned earlier, between idealism and practicality. So once we, these kids came in, we decided, let's put some more effort behind this notion of sustainability than we have, because we don't want future generations to hate us. It just wouldn't be good. And why would I love someone four generations from now that ain't blood kin to me, or maybe that is, any less than I love my brothers and sisters that are here now. That's such a rude idea. So we decided that we would do something really simple. We would install in our company with the support, and we got it enthusiastically from our key team members, this idea called a Sustainable Practices Initiative, and it's very simple. It just said, we are sincere about considering future generations with all our decisions in the physical world and in the social world, because we're also not going to go very far as a, spe as a species if we continue to not like someone because of their eye shape, their skin color, their sexual orientation, their religion. This is all such malarkey, and how we as a species can continue to do it is just unacceptable. So whatever we can do to be proactive on that in our little corner of the world, let's just god dang figure out how to do it, and we'll take some chances. We won't bet the whole farm on being, being uh, uh, progressive, but let's see if we can be more progressive than we are now. And again, just throwing that lens up opened up all kinds of things to us. This hotel is an extraordinary example. It's still the only lead platinum restaurant in the United States. There's only two other lead platinum hotels. It's extraordinary. And it shouldn't be because it wasn't all that hard. All we did was plug in our sincerity and put some energy next to it. And about $3 million extra money. But, uh, but that, that, that shows a level of sincerity. I always say you only know if you have a value if you state it. It's if you're willing to take a risk for it or inconvenience yourself for it. Otherwise, all you have is rhetoric. We empathize like crazy, but we don't attach action to our empathy as a species. It's extraordinary. I, if I get real close out here, I can see y'all. <laughs> so um, that's why I keep leaning in here. I don't know if you can see me. This is awfully high lectern. Um, so anyway, <laughs> I don't know who they designed this thing for. Um, but, <laughs> but anyway, um, what, 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 what happened for us is, with, with those objectives, we also had the objective is we knew we were going to own this thing for a while. We didn't plan to sell it, so we knew we could save money on utilities, $140,000 a year. We knew for the rege regenerative, uh, you know, what's more important, impressive than that, and this is mostly because coal's so cheap, 500 tons of coal each year is not burned because of the energy we don't use. <laughs> it, 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 it's extraordinary. So I said, man, let's buy a ton of coal so we can show people what a ton of coal costs. And I said, we, we could never afford that. I figured it was $1,500. You know what a ton of coal is? It's $100. That's why we burn coal like crazy. In, Green, in Winston-Salem, 100% of your energy, well, 98%, 2% becomes natural gas, comes from coal. And it's $100 a ton. Hell, that ought to be $1,000 a ton. Uh, it's ridiculous what we're, what we're doing out there. But anyway, we were able to accomplish some pretty interesting things. I'm going to jump, though, to some philosophical things, because if you want to share something, you've got the podium, you might as well do it. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, first of all, when you talk about starting with process rather than uh, um, with... Uh, uh, with process mindset rather than outcome mindset, then there's just a couple of ways to do that that I'd love to share. Rather than saying, where do you want to go on vacation, say, what experience do you want on vacation? Just an illustrated example of what I'm uh, talking about. And then um, la one last thing I want to point out is that I believe that... Uh, that we really live on ideas. And if we can connect with these ideas and make them who we are, we have such an opportunity to be fully alive in this brief amount of time that we get to be on this orb. And one of the great things that's influenced me through the years is this man, Ram Dass, that's written and said some really beautiful things about how to experience in life and how to really be a brother and a sister out in the universe. He wrote this wonderful book you'll know from the 60s called Be Here Now. Recently, he wrote Be Love Now. Our idea 
is let's be, as an organization and as individuals in our organization, let's not just think about these things. Let's be love. Let's be compassion. Let's be service. That's the story that I'd love to share. Cheers. Peace. Dennis, thank you so much.